welcome to Church in the Home. We have groups all around the world. Some countries have several groups in their country. You have over 50 groups in, in uh, South Africa alone. And this is the way we spread the gospel in this program. We spread the message. We are a message. We don't hesitate to be a message. We don't hesitate to talk to you and anyone around the world about what our message is. Our message is life in the sun. Our message is about the Son of God and about His Father. And we're all getting ready to go to that place where they live, where they prepared the place for us. And I hope that your heart is open also to the gospel. We believe that the message that we preach to you is the gospel. It is the final gospel. Somebody said, are you preaching the true gospel? Well, usually when people say that, it means that they themselves have come to what truth is on their own. We're not like that. We live right with the scriptures. I believe the scriptures line upon line, verse upon verse, word upon word, and as long as we stick with that, we'll not go astray. Now, there are a lot of people today that have a difference in the words. They could put different interpretations on them. Greek scholars have difference in a lot of words, and they put their interpretation to them. But if you just get a good old King James Bible, and you'll live in it and study it, you'll get God's message. His message is there. You know why? Because that's the book I believe the Holy Spirit still works through. That's not the only book he works through, but that's the book he works through under the commission that Jesus gave him in John 14, 15, and 16 when Jesus introduced the person of the Holy Spirit to the believers. And if you want to know what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do, you get in John 14, 15, and 16 and hear what Christ himself has to say about the Holy Spirit. We're so glad to greet you wherever you are around the world. We're getting uh, all worked up about the different things that have happened to our different fellowships around the world. And I pray for each one of you that are leaders. If you're a leader in a home group, if you're a leader over a country, I pray for you that God will bless you and use you. We here in America have but one objective, and that is to supply you with the final gospel so that people can know what God is doing right up to the last minute of him dealing with us on this earth. We're so glad that you tuned in today. And Of course, this program wouldn't be complete. It wouldn't be altogether right if we didn't hear a word from Robbie. She's the one that helped put together this whole thing. She's the she helped to put me together, and I'm thankful for every little thing she does. She's under the she's under the wisdom and anointing of the Holy Spirit in doing what she has to do, and she does a lot. Come on, Robin, and say a word to these people. Well, today was a day <clears throat> when uh, <laughs> I was cramming a lot of things into a short period of time. Um, do you do that? <laughs> Um, had to have the CPA over this morning because he works during, <clears throat> during the week, so I have to use him when I can get him. So I had him coming at 9 o'clock, and of course Wanda starts biscuits at 9 o'clock. <coughs> um, those of you who are not making here for biscuits, she made whole wheat biscuits this morning, so y'all can come and have a, kind of a nutritional biscuit too. Mm -hmm. So um, just cramming a lot of things into a short span of time, and uh, so it's kind of a come-as-you-are day for me. <laughs> Please don't stay home because your hair doesn't just work out just right. You get up and you're having a bad hair day, don't stay home because of it. And if you feel like it's kind of a throw yourself together and get here, well, do that. Um, I remember one time we had a meeting in Houston. We had two meetings down in the Houston area, and we were, we were doing the driving trip um, that time. <coughs> And so we got up real early. We left the house here at like 5 o'clock in the morning and drove down to South Houston. And then I think at 2 o'clock we had another meeting over at Conroe. And so, you know, you're throwing things together to get in that car to get on the road so that you are, are there in time. Well, I, I was doing a lot of the driving so he could rest and study and so forth. So I just put my pretty fuzzy slippers on to drive because it was comfortable. So I got to the meeting, and it was in a house, thank the Lord. 
And so I went to go change out of my slippers. I didn't have my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a nice suit on. I was dressed nice with these big, fluffy, white, or pink sh the slippers. And I just did a real ha-ha about that because if, I, if we were scheduled to speak at the big church downtown, I would have been in a bad, I probably would have stayed home that day. I wouldn't have done the come as you are for sure. But here you can, you can, you know, if, you, if your hair isn't all put together and, and you forgot your shoes, well, you can go ahead and come here to fellowship. But, you know, it's, <laughs> just make it a ha-ha day. <laughs> I have to do that pretty often. <laughs> Either that or grit my teeth, so it's better to do the ha-ha. Um, I've really been taken up with the Apostle Paul. We get accused as a fellowship just being, um, you know, putting Paul ahead of Jesus Christ or honoring him more than Christ, which is stupid to even state, say that. But Christ did speak to Paul and gave him a message to give to us, the Gentiles. Right. And um, sad to say, you can turn that boob tube on and listen to a multitude of those who are supposed to be God's minister, bringing, quote, God's message to people, and they don't get it. They very once in a while they go into the epistles of Paul or the, or, or or John, the epistles of John, places where the the grace message, the the mystery message is is spoken of. They don't honor Paul, and we do honor Paul. Um, you know, uh, some of you got my letter with the what ifs in it. And I, and I was thinking about that. What if the apostle Paul? You know, he had those three years on the Arabian desert, dry, hot desert, no one was there but Paul and Jesus. Three years, that's a long time. And you know, he had to be stripped of the, of the indoctrination, the deep indoctrination into the law and the customs and everything that he had been programmed all his life. And he being a Jew, you know, he had a lot for the Father to, to, to deal with and to, and to strip to bring him this message. But what if the Father had given him all this understanding and revelation and, and so forth, and he didn't take time to script it and write it down? That would have been a catastrophe. Because here we are, uh, generations later, many generations later, with, with, the, with the message that Paul gave the Apostle Paul. And uh, I've really been taken up with his writings. Um, you know, if I, get, if I get irritated and cantankerous and um, just, just something starts gnawing and eating inside of me and I know I better get in the scriptures. Because I, I, you know, you can open up the Bible and digest one or two verses, five or six verses, and it's like it settles you down, it fixes you, it, it reprograms you, it, it, it ignites with this life in you, Christ in you, the, 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 the written word, when you take it in, it, it connects with this life of Christ in you. And, and, and it makes a difference. Uh, it makes a big difference. <coughs> so when you get irritable and cantankerous, maybe Robbie's the only one that gets cantankerous and irritable at times, but <laughs> I know where to go. I know, I know my source. Did you nudge her? <laughs> but I know my source. And, um, you know, we're, like I said, we're just cramming so much into a, such a short time span in our lives. And um, sometimes we don't know if we're coming or going. You know, we're going in circles. Howard, have I eaten at my 10 minutes yet? Um, <laughs> But, but you, 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 like Warren was just saying, there has to be some priorities in our lives. The Holy Spirit deals with you every day. You can't say he doesn't. He is working, he's dealing with your thinking, he's dealing in your life, he's working your life. That's what the Father said he was sent to do and he does it. He doesn't say, I'm not going to do that today. They're not worthy today. They haven't <coughs> earned it today, so I'm not going to deal with them today. The, Holy, the, the Father sent the Holy Spirit 
to work in your soulish part every single day, 24-7, 365. Amen. Amen. So now, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? Now, in casual conversation, you can, you can tell another person exactly what you know you should be doing. You can say it. I know I'm doing this and I should be doing that. How do you know that? Because the Holy Spirit nudged you. The Holy Spirit brought that into your mind. He brought that into your knowing. You know what it is to have a knowing? There's, there's things you just know. It's a, it's a knowing. The Holy Spirit did his work. How, how are we doing? How are we handling what the Holy Spirit uh, brings to us? Uh, this Christ in us is to be an expression in our lives. He, is, he wants to express himself through us as we go about our days, whatever we're doing. He wants to express. Are we expressing us? Are we just kind of moving him aside and, and, and going ahead and expressing our own uh, self? Are we expressing our own self? Now, Christ wants to express himself through our self. You're going to say it like you say it. You're going to wave your hands a certain way. You're going to roll your eyes a certain way. You, I mean, you, he's going to express himself through yourself. Mm -hmm. But we can just nudge him aside and go ahead and express the part of us that we think we are. Now, am, I, am I making sense on this point? Yes. And we do it. We all do it. We all, we all have a way of, of just um, lapsing back to the old way of living, the old, the old way of thinking. It doesn't mean Christ has left us. He's still there, and he's still waiting for us to <clears throat> get out of the way, to get out of the way so that he can live and express himself through us. But you know, he's not bossy. He's not, he's not aggressive. Now, you, you, we, we, we can live all of the days of our lives in this little box that we call our life. This is my life. This is the box I live in. This is how I live it. And we can stay in that box living our own lives until we die, until the Father takes us home. Wayne comes in one morning and he said top of the morning to you and the rest to me and of course we laughed about that and I, told, I told wanda i told wanda when wayne stands before the father he's going to say top of the morning to me or to you and the rest to me i don't think so <laughs> I think the father will just flick his eyelid or flick his finger or something and Wayne's going to be somewhere else. <laughs> Probably at the back of the line. Wayne, Wayne, you go back at the back of the line and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with you later. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's how we all live though, see. We, we all... We all kind of lapse back into what we think makes us us and, and what, what we think impresses other people. And um, my problem is my Irish temper still. I have lapses sometimes where I get really irritated with things. I don't blow up like I used to. I deal with it a lot nicer than I used to, but I still have those times when my ire gets stirred up. Mary, you do too. <laughs> <laughs> You don't show it as much, but you do too. <laughs> Does she show it? <laughs> but you see, the Holy Spirit is still, the Holy Spirit is still dealing with us. Thank the Lord that He yes. deals with us. Thank the Lord that He doesn't give up on us. Th praise the Lord that He is so faithful. You know, th 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 we, we, we can take some hard knocks by not listening and not, and not living the way we should by the knowledge we have. But uh, Don said uh, there are no wrong doors. You, you can't go through a wrong door. If you go through that wrong door, you're probably not going to go through it again. But if you go through it again, you're not going to go through it the third time. <coughs> but if you go through it the third time, you're sure not going to go through that same wrong door the fourth time. 
So God says there are no, no wrong doors. You're, you're, you're going to learn your lesson at some point. So <laughs> Anyway, I just want to encourage you to, you know, I'm just so impressed with the Apostle Paul. I was, the, the 14 epistles that he wrote, he makes some references to, to the Old Testament. He makes some references to other sayings and, that he's read. But the, but the most of what he wrote in the epistles is his revelation of Christ. He did, he's, not, he's not reading someone else's book or, or writing someone else's book in these epistles. It's his. It's coming. This, that's his revelation that Christ gave to him to give to us. That is his revelation. That is the mystery. And I'm so impressed. Warren talks a lot about the Apostle Paul. Y'all may get tired of it. But, you know, you might as well give up because until his dying breath, you're going to be hearing the message that Christ gave to the Apostle Paul <coughs> to give to us. And um, I'm just so impressed with, with you, read, you read Paul's writings. It's different. It is so different than anything else written in this book. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, you could read one, two, three verses, and it's, it's, just, it's so profound, it's so deep. You can take... Each little phrase, each little segment of that of that uh, scripture, and it's powerful, it's profound, and, and 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 you can meditate on it, and it can have impact in your thinking and in your life. So, keep a Bible in your bathroom. That's a good place to pick it up and read one scripture or two scriptures. <laughs> I love you. Wonderful, that's wonderful. That's great. Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians, chapter 3. We're going to be reading at verse 7. Ephesians 3 and 7 reads, Whereof I was made. You get that? He was made a minister. <coughs> and we got all kinds of ministers nowadays. We have college ministers. We have seminary ministers. We have self-ambitious ministers. We have highly intellectual ministers. <coughs> but notice what he says. I was made a minister. What made Paul a minister? Next line says, according to the gift of the grace of God. According to the gift of the grace of God. You see, Paul was the meanest man in the New Testament. He was out killing followers of Jesus Christ when God arrested him on the road to Damascus and called him by his grace. And so he says, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. How was he made a minister? It was a gift from God. Don't you wish that all ministers consider themselves a gift from God. I try never to tell much of my background. I don't tell much about how I got to where I am now. Oh, I bring out a little maybe, but I don't talk about my education. I don't talk about my past life. I don't talk about all the places I preach. I doubt seriously that there's any preacher today that have preached in more American cities than I have. I could only find two states I hadn't preached in. So I preached in most of the states here in the United States more than one time. I don't <coughs> brag about that. I needed that. That was my training. That was my coming to know Christ as my life. So that was a gift God gave me. The gift of the grace of God. Now notice, it was given unto him by the effectual working of his power. 
ministers that are called by God and given a gift receive it by the power of God. May we never run out of that power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. Verse 8. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's a Jew. He had been called by God to minister to people who are not of his race, do not have his customs, were never included in the plan of God before. Jesus himself <laughs> called Gentiles dogs. That's the lowest thing you could call them. And so here it was, he considers himself a gift of God given to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. But here's my text. And to make all men, all men, that's Jews, Gentiles, and whatever, all men, even dogs, all men, puppies, all men see what is the fellowship <coughs> of the mystery. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which before... The world began, has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. That ninth verse has struck me prior to this meeting as being a most important verse in our understanding. He first is made a minister by the grace of God. That comes through the power of God, which is given to him also. He is less than any of the saints. He doesn't claim to be somebody big, great, or important. But his mission, what is his mission? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, I don't have many challenges from the Apostle Paul. I don't have many times he tells me to do something. Jesus told his uh, children to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and he used five different cases of scripture to explain that. I don't get anything like that from Paul. This is one of the few things I get from Paul. To make all men see what is the mystery. Because seeing the mystery constitutes a fellowship. A fellowship. When I started preaching around the world, this was one of the most glaring things shining right out of the scriptures that hit me. It was that wherever I went and preached the mystery, there was a constituted fellowship. The people who knew what the mystery was immediately bonded to me. Not just to me, but to the Christ in me, to the message. That was an immediate bond. And that's what Paul calls a fellowship. That there is a group of people God has put together on this earth who constitute a fellowship of the mystery. Now, the word mystery throws a lot of people because their worldly minds immediately go, well, is there a soothsayer here? Is there somebody who, who uh, counts palms or goes into your past and tells you things, wizard and so forth? No, that's not even to open your mind. The great mystery, the greatest mystery there has ever been, the greatest mystery that still most human beings have never gotten a hold of, the mystery is plainly defined in Colossians chapter 1. The great mystery is Christ living in human beings. What has that done? <coughs> Preaching this message that Christ is the life of a Christian. 
That's what a Christian is. A Christian is one in whom Christ lives. No use talking about your progenitors or talking about the people who started your ministry or movement or who started your church or wrote this book 200 years ago or what. The scripture is plain. The great mystery is Christ in you, your hope of glory. That's the great mystery. It's, it's not a far out thing. It is the most spoken of thing in any one place in the Bible. In the New Testament, it is the most often spoken of thing in the whole of the Bible. In Christ. In Christ. In Christ. So this great mystery has created a fellowship. <coughs> a fellowship. I was struck by that <coughs> this past week. We were in uh, one of the malls here. And I was walking down the mall and all of a sudden somebody hollered and said, Hey, wait a minute. And turned and there said a lady whom I hadn't seen in, I'd say, over 20 years. I didn't even know who she was because I'm perfect in that area. I never remember a face and never remember a name. <laughs> <laughs> and she reached up when I walked over to her and she grabbed me and hugged me right there in, in the mall. I knew something. That's the outworking of the mystery. She hugged my neck. She said, you may not remember me, but she said, I attended your church many years ago, and my life has been changed ever since. Hallelujah. Praise God. The mystery is a fellowship of believers who cannot forget it. I'll tell you what believers are having a great struggle right here in this city where we are now. They are people who know this and can't get out of the bondage they're in, religious bondage, family bondage, different reasons everybody has. But they'll never forget the message they heard that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Don't ever take that for granted. Don't ever say, well, I already know all that. Don't ever, because it is a fellowship of believers. What is this fellowship? The fellowship is among those who have seen Christ as their life. Now, I drive down the streets of our cities here, and I see the word fellowship on a whole lot of church signs. They're trying to make fellowship a church. And in one sense, it's okay. But in another sense, I see fellowship as Paul explains it. The fellowship is of the mystery. The fellowship is of the people who know Christ lives in them. We in this place are a fellowship. Every once in a while, someone comes to me and says, well, what do you mean by fellowship? Is, do you have a church? Is it a church? And I'll say, yes, yes, we're part of the body of Christ. You can call that the church. But more than that, I explain to them, that's a group of believers who see Christ as their life. Now, if you were to ask me to define the word Christian or Christianity, I would define it in those same words. A Christian is one in whom Christ lives. He's not one who goes to church. He's not one who pays tithes and offerings. He's not one who does the good works and backs and supports a preacher. A Christian is one who knows Christ lives in him. Now, doesn't it seem right to you that those who know that should be a part of a fellowship? I didn't come here to Dallas to start a church. I came here to join together a fellowship. A fellowship of believers who seek Christ as their life. We have a lot of people who haven't seen Christ as their life. They're welcome. 
because they're growing, they're coming into that knowledge, and it takes sometimes a long period of time for them to empty out enough stuff that's in their mind to accept this new thought that I no longer live. As Paul said, Christ liveth in me. That's what constitutes a fellowship, Christ living in believers. So we call ourselves the Christ Life Fellowship. It is a fellowship of people who have Christ's life in them. Well, actually, it means that his spirit has taken over our spirit and has made us one with him. That's really what it means. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And so our spirit has been joined to Christ's spirit, and we become one. We are the mysterious people. We are a part of the great mystery. I'm glad Paul called it that. Now when Jesus introduced this thing first, back when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again or you can't enter or see the things of God. Now being born again is the same as a mystery because being born again means that an old life dies. And God puts a new life called his son in you. He is the new life. That's what a Christian is. That's what a, a Christian is. not just a church member. It's not just a Baptist preacher or a Methodist preacher or Catholic rabbi or whatever. A Christian is one in whom Christ lives. They know the difference. They've had a revelation of that. They have studied the scriptures, the, the, the book of the Constitution and Bylaws of Christian Living, Paul's epistles. They've studied them to where they understand that. So when somebody asks me, what is a fellowship? I say, it's a group of people who believe Christ lives in them. Now that seems strange. Seems like we're different from Baptist, Methodist, or Catholic or somebody, we're not really because many of them have Christ in them. We've never, we've never said that wasn't so. They've had Christ in them. But if they don't know it, it don't really matter. You understand me? If you got genuinely saved, God baptized you into Christ, not in water, in spirit. You were baptized into Christ. Christ is your life. You didn't ask for that, and you never asked for it, and you've been trying to live up to it. It would be so nice if you understood what happened to you. You were put into Christ, and Christ obviously was put into you. You in him, he in you. That's what a Christian is. Paul never used the word born again because he went a step deeper and said it's a great mystery. But it wouldn't have been good, I don't suppose, if all Christians had taken over the word mystery and said this is a church of the mystery because that means something different to the world. That means something different to humanity. They've all been trained about <coughs> mysteries of one kind or another. And uh, we have people who say, I love a mystery, but they never have it. included this word as a part of what they love usually. The mystery is Christ in you. That's what we are in this place. We have Christ in us. That's our hope of glory. We know we're going to make it because it is not I, it's Him. Mm -hmm. How do I know I'm going to make it? I fail lots of times. I fall short at times. I'm not what I say I am sometimes, and I have to repent of it. But that's not what's going to make it or not going to make it. What's going to make me a child of God and get me into the Father's house is the Christ who lives in me. See, I may be failing God and living like I ought to live up to the resurrection morning. And I read something the other day that, that helped me out in this point from a theologian, and he said, on the resurrection morning, you're going to be everything you thought you could be. Why? You got a new body. You got new flesh. And that's the downfall of most people is that they live by the flesh instead of the spirit. 
but that's another message. In this place, we are a fellowship of the mystery, to, to put it according to Ephesians, third chapter. Several things I want to say about this fellowship. In the Christ life, our very term of who we define ourselves as, Christ life, is the beginning of a fellowship. Because in this place, I seek only people who want to know Christ in his fullness. I seek only people who are willing to believe what the scripture says. We are that fellowship of the mystery. We are not the only fellowship of the mystery in this area, in this town or whatever, but we are pressing toward that. That's what we want to be. And I want every member of his body in this place to ascend to that position that this is what our fellowship is. You may like some of the people here, you may not like them, that don't matter. But if you see Christ in somebody else, that does matter. That constitutes the beginning of a fellowship. I love you. I don't ask you to define my love for you because I haven't the ability to love you, but he that is in me has the ability to love. Uh, yeah. Dwight read the scripture, God is love. Mm -hmm. See, that's how I love you, because Christ is the lover and he lives in me. Yeah. So we are at that stage in this fellowship. We're at that place to where we're beginning to see what fellowship is. Fellowship is that special link between human <coughs> beings that are guided by another life, not their old life. Amen. Get that? Amen. That's as simple as I can make it. In this place, we are people who are guided by this Christ who lives in us and nothing else. Well, I could press that into law real quick. You ought not to miss a meeting. You ought to, you ought to give more money to God. You ought to do this, you ought to do that. But I never do that because our fellowship is not really in what you do. It's in who he is in you. Amen. You get it? What is Christ to you? What is he in you? God put him in every sinner that's saved. He never gets his rightful place. Most sinners become church members, and most die as good church members, and most of them will go to the Father's house. But they'll never know what Christianity is. That's my mission in this world, is to make sure you know that. I don't want to see anybody get saved that doesn't understand this is your first step toward the Father's house. Their first step toward your relationship with God. Your first step toward seeing Christ as your life and God as your Father. That's what ought to be told. The sinner ought to know that so that they not get mixed up in something religious before it's too late to get out of it. Number two, our fellowship is where believers see Jesus only as their life. See Jesus only as their life. First Corinthians five and sixteen, we have that vividly pointed out. I see Jesus. I see Christ as my life. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Think about it. Another point, a fellowship is where there is no strife, there's no confusion, there's no hate. If I misdirect somebody, I got little voices that speak up, 
within me, I got outside big voices that holler at me, and I get corrected. You must willingly stand that as a believer of Jesus Christ when you're out of bounds and you turn back to the old mind and your old way of doing things, you cease to see Jesus only. Another thought. A fellowship where there is no hate. No hate. I've watched things progress here in this city. I've watched the big churches and what they went through. I've watched them love pastors and hate pastors. I've watched bodies of believers that went to court to get somebody to prove their point. But you know what? That strife and that hate is non-Christian. But of course, if you don't learn that Christ is your life, you will learn one other thing in religion. And that is, I've got to stand by what I believe. And so I lay it on you very clearly today. I don't care what you believe. What I care about is in whom you believe. That's most important. Another thing. When you're joined to a fellowship of believers, and I'm calling for this in this place, we're so disconnected here that some of you live over 100 miles away from this meeting and have to drive and get to it. Some of you are out of work right now, and I pray myself, Rob and I do, that you will find work that God would have you to do. We don't forget you. But I don't want you to forget other members of this body. We are each attached to the body of Christ, as I told you in the last meeting. You're like a babe in a mother's womb, and you're drawing from that mother's body life and strength and water and whatever. You're drawing that. We're a body here. Maybe the person right next to you in the body of Christ is going through a very difficult time. You know who God will use to help them? The one next to them. Their brother, their sister. He'll use them. So you have no place left for you, the big eye. Always first consideration is that I'm attached in the body of Christ to another believer. And we are both drawing the same life, the same food, the same subsistence from that body as anybody else. We both are. One more thought. In this body of Christ, we know that the love, the power, and all of the works of grace are His. I consider there to be two big parts to the understanding of grace. One part is, he finished it all, it's all done, it's over, it's finished, the cross has completed it, there's no more God will do. You need to believe what he has done. And then you need to realize that now that Christ is in you, he is superseding you. He's bigger than you are. If you have a great thought, say, thank you, Jesus. Thank him. Mm -hmm. If you did something magnanimous, blessing to others, you need to say, thank you, Jesus, for being alive in me. If you see the brother next to you that's in great need, great trouble, 
You need to share what you have with them. Why? Because if they've run out of supply, you haven't. And if both of you run out of supply, there's more coming. Because that's the way it works. You're like having a well of living water within you. Maybe like our old well out here. Sometimes it's got a whole lot of water available and sometimes I can't hardly get water out of it. But I know the water's coming because it's an inexhaustible supply. And so it is with Christ in you. So it is, dear friend. And I talk to you and I bring you a message that it is Christ in you that is your hope of glory. You have no hope of it. And here lately I've just noticed at funerals, not ones that I preached, but where somebody else is preaching, that they don't say a whole lot about this fact that Christ was in this brother, he was saved. So he's going to be with his father who birthed him. I don't hear much about that. Maybe they don't know it. Maybe they don't understand it. Maybe they don't want to understand it. But that's a severe thought with me. I don't want to ever see a Christ-like believer crying because they have to leave this world. That's why you're here, is for that move. You understand it? The only reason you're here, being taught by the Spirit and having the Word of God in hand, Actually, you're going to have the same word. The word is eternal, so you'll have it when you get to heaven, too. It'd be amazing what the scriptures will do for you then. But you've got all these things working for you. We need to loosen up and live up to what we already know in this book. So when somebody asks you what a fellowship is, just simply tell them it's a fellowship of believers in whom Christ lives. And we have the greatest proof of that of any proof that's in the Bible. Because as we often say, 146 times Paul says we're in Christ. And whatever seminarians say about it, to us it means simply what it says. In Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, I quit. How you like that? <laughs> Enough said. Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand, will you? Won't hurt to hold hands with him. Christ lives in him. See Jesus in him. See Jesus in him. Yeah, I know. Look him in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you. Because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me. That's it. Hug every neck you can till we meet together again. God love you.